podcast where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie authors on their journey to publication. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction. And I'm Christina Catane, and I write multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. Um, Jennifer Tong isn't with us again today. Our condolences go out to her as she is um, still dealing with the passing of her aunt. Um, but we're going to start the podcast with our What's Up segment, where we kind of go around the virtual table and check in with each of us to find out what's going on in our personal lives. And if you want to share what's up with you in the chat box, we'd be happy to see that as well. Although, is anybody ready to read the chat? I'm not. Did anybody pull the chat up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll be able to see it on my screen. So. Okay. Well, what's up with you, uh, Tina? Um, well, this cute little blonde thing with blue eyes, who's just so adorable, was a secret weapon. She was weaponized when she came into our home on Saturday. <laughs> and um, she had a virus. And Aww. so my first my son and then me have come down with this nasty head cold thing that's going on. So... If I go mute in the middle of a sentence or something, it's because I have to hack my brains out. Oh, I'll be back. Sweet little grandbaby. It's so funny because my mom, she can't resist the hugs and kisses. I mean, even if she's like, oh, and she kind of knows someone's germed up. She still wants to go in and get that hug or kiss. And I know it's really hard to resist. Rhonda's shaking her head. No, no, Rhonda. not me. <laughs> Just wait. Rhonda. Like, I'll see you later. Just wait. <laughs> And I also, I have to show Rhonda what I've been doing this week while I've been sick and, and my internet's been down. And, show all of us. Why do you have to show just Rhonda? That's not well, fair. Well, because she'll appreciate it more. Ah. Oh, oh, yeah. wow. oh, oh, my oatmeal box that I emptied. I'm trying to get it in the camera. Oh. That is so cute. I love your lettering. I have my like washi tape all over it. And that then is I so have pretty. A, so I've been doodling on it. Oh, the dragonfly. Oh. Yeah. And so this is my little box to keep all my journaling pens in. Oh, that is so cute. I totally approve. So, okay. I, I love that I, watercolor washi tape. So, yeah, my internet's been messing around with me, too. It's, they've been having blackouts with Xfinity. Mm. So I haven't been able to work. So, you know, that's what okay, I'm Okay, I'm feeling like uh, you're a teacher's pet. Because first of all, you wrote romance last week and Jennifer said, <laughs> good job. And then you did a craft project this week and Ron is telling you good job. And I'm so jealous of all your words of affirmation. I might have to do something crafty okay. <laughs> or yeah, romantic. And I'll write a short story next week. So you Yay, can... then I'll say, good job, Tina. <laughs> Although, we try to write short stories every week, don't we? With our yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anyway, that was my week. All right. Well, um, I'll tell y'all what's going on with me before we jump over to Rhonda. So it's not too much of my voice right in a row. But so it's really. Oh, wait. Maria Johnson says she's been full of a cold all week. Oh, no. Aww. So she relates to Tina. Today is the first day she feels pretty much herself again. Oh, boo. That's the pits. And I hate when it just kind of hangs around and you start to count the weeks that you've been feeling cruddy and you wonder if you will ever feel normal again. Oh, that's the worst. So sorry. I'm curious if she stuck with writing or if she uh, had to put it aside while she was sick. Um, yeah. Sure. And uh, Tina, I know that you've been, you've been taking some, like you've been taking some uh, herbs via soup or something that you think have really boosted your immune system. You well, have I a made, tip out there yeah, for anybody? I made bone broth. Mm. Um, so you have, it's like a whole lesson, but macronutrients, you got protein, fat, and carbohydrates. All foods fall into one of those three categories. And protein is the building blocks of your body. So when you're sick and your body is fighting an infection or virus, you're losing blood cells because they're fighting. And so the white blood cells are dying in the process. And so bone broth, you... Um, Basically make it the way you would a regular broth. You put lots of bones in there and then you put a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and I put it in my pressure cooker for two hours and it pulls all the collagen out of the bones. Um, and so then that adds all that protein and collagen when you drink it helps your body to replenish those cells and to rebuild itself. Okay, I just went on a total tangent in my mind based on our talk that we had the, the last time we were together about our glorified bodies. And I never really realized that there's war. There's war in your body when you're sick. And so 
you think in the glorified body, there will be something different. You know, those mechanisms mm -hmm. will be different because I would imagine that the war would stop and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's that. Yay. Yeah. Um, um, also, okay. Gina, just another little thing is that calcium and vitamin C need each other to be absorbed. So, yes. or used by the body. So that's another reason bone broth is, mm -hmm. and chicken soup is so helpful when you're sick. Yeah. So mm. I, I used my bone broth to make a vegetable soup where I put lots of garlic and ginger and um, antibiotic type veggies mm -hmm. in there and spinach. So no vampires and, either. No. <laughs> and I have to say that um, turmeric tea tastes a lot better when you have no taste. <laughs> <laughs> when your taste starts to come back, it's a little hard to get down. No. Mm. All right. Well, um, if there's nothing else in the chat box, I will share that. Okay. So when I lived in Michigan, we had um, always to think about whether or not we were going to get a snow day when we were trying to plan things in the winter months. And so I flew to Florida where I thought that I would perhaps be finished dealing with weather cancellations. But alas, there is something called the tropical storm and there's a tropical storm kind of forming or something out in the Gulf. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tina, for those of you who are audio only, Tina's playing the world's smallest violin for me. Uh, my heart bleeds for you. Um, anyway, but we were supposed to go camping on um, somewhere near ish to the Gulf coast this weekend and we were canceled because of the 80% chance of tropical storm activity. I mean, a little bit drizzly or whatever, AHG and trail life, we're tough. We'll go in the drizzly rain and we'll still camp, a little cold, whatever. But not if there's tropical storm warning. So we were canceled. And that's pretty much the biggest thing that happened to me this week. Um, what about you, Rhonda? Well, I also had a storm. It wasn't tropical, but it sure looked like a hurricane on the map. Uh, we had 30 to 40 mile an hour winds. I'm I'm up here at our cabin up north at the tip of Michigan and um, having a little writing retreat with my mom. And it was so such a good day to do that because it was rainy all day. It felt like our house just kept kind of shaking just a little bit. And the waves were, I felt like I was on um, the ocean side of Florida because the waves actually were bigger than sometimes they are down there. Wow. Like uh, su supposedly there were up to eight foot waves um, up here on this side of the state. Okay. The so state. for those who aren't super geographically familiar, which lake are you referring to? Lake Huron. Lake, is Huron. Referring to. Mm -hmm. lake Michigan last week though had 14 foot waves. So mm. people who think that the Great Lakes are just like little puddles are wrong. They are many oceans. Mm -hmm. Without the sharks. Without the sharks and salt free. Although they are starting to find alligators up there in y'all's lakes. So what? watch out. What? Yeah. A couple um, in recent, like in the year that I've been here, there's been a couple of times people are like, another alligator found in a Michigan lake. Mm -hmm. But never a great lake. So I always am thinking it's probably released pets. And, um, oh, that's and so I don't funny. see how they could survive the winter. Yeah, they, people don't know, and and like people, I'm guessing scientists, whatever. But it, the freak out always seems to kind of be like, why, why is there an alligator here? Did it? Is it overwintering? I mean, is it somehow living? I don't know. Escape from so. the Chicago sewers, probably. <laughs> I wonder yes, but if they can be frozen, like some fish get frozen in the winter, and then when they thaw out in the spring, they're just alive again. My sister works, well, she used to work in the restaurant industry down here in Florida, and she found a lizard in the ice maker. So, of course, she had to empty the whole ice maker and sanitize and everything like that. Well, when she was emptying the ice maker, she put the lizard in a potted plant. She didn't just throw it in the garbage, okay? And sure enough, that bad boy unthawed and, and scampered away while she was cleaning out the ice maker. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. So, Maria um, said... I wasn't able to do any editing while I was sick, but I've been filling up my notebook with plotting drafting for Nano. So that's a, a good productive. idea. Good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Wow. Way way to go for being productive, even though you weren't feeling like it. Ugh. Yep. I am like really a baby when I'm not feeling well. I've realized. Mm -hmm. mm, I don't like to do things. Okay. Well, we're gonna jump into the topic for today, which is elements of story, part two. 
So if you were with us last week, we were talking about the very basic building blocks of story. And today we're going to cover some of the more intricate pieces that help you get from a blank page to a finished story. And here's a question. If you're going to actually start a book, and remember, I'm someone who really struggled with how to begin my most recent work in progress so badly was I stuck that I just had to stop thinking about it and write the middle. <laughs> so how do you start a story? Where does one begin? First of all, what do you guys think about a prologue? And who's who wants to define a prologue, first of all? Because maybe someone brand new to writing has no clue what I'm even talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally, I don't mind a prologue. Um, you know, especially if they're done well, because it can, you can provide a lot of backstory that doesn't have to be super attached to the book, but it helps you understand where you are um, or what, how to interpret the beginning of the book. Um, so I think, I don't know that I've ever read a prologue that I didn't appreciate. I know as a young reader, I would confuse the prologue with like the editor's notes. Mm -hmm. And I never liked to read the editor's notes because obviously it was version whatever of the novel that was being put out. And then mm -hmm. the editor would spoil a bunch of stuff for me. And I would be like, why? Mm -hmm. So as a young reader, I would often mm -hmm. skip the prologue thinking it was more of that kind of information. And mm -hmm. it makes me wonder what I missed. So the argument would be like, why would you not just make the prologue chapter one? What is the argument? for a prologue as opposed to that being chapter one. Right. Well, chapter one needs to introduce your character and their problem. As opposed to a prologue, which does what? Uh, well, for my, for instance, in my book that I wrote, my prologue is information that the reader needs to understand the world that my writer, that my writer, that my main character is in, but it, she's not in it. And it happened 400 years before she was born. Oh. So it's kind of history of her world um, that helps the reader to put her world into context when we introduce her. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a very, very good example. Okay. All right. um, I don't recommend this book for all audiences, but I read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo when it came out. And the prologue, I just, the prologue was like, I don't know, 12 pages or something. And I just kind of skipped over it. And I got part of the way through the book and I thought, you know what, maybe I should just read the prologue. And I'm so glad that I did because it was almost like a mini story that happened 20 or so years before the actual beginning of this story. And it was very necessary information. So Rhonda, do you, is that typical of you to skip prologues? Uh, it depends on, I don't know, my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw it, it was 20 pages, I thought, oh, this probably isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. I just want to get to the story. Oh, okay. a lot of times it looks like a book I just started uh, when I was at home. Why can't I think of what book that was? Anyway, the prologue is a page and a half. And so, of course, I'm going to read that. Gotcha. gotcha. I personally love prologues. I think they're juicy and they get me in the right frame of mind when, for when I start the story. And I also mm -hmm. love epilogues, but that's the different topic, right? So, but. If you call it a prologue, are you free to do a lot more telling instead of showing because you're just trying to get information communicated to the reader? Or do you still have to be as artful and uh, whatever as you would be for a chapter one, say? I think it needs to be as well written as the book. Yes, because that's the first thing your reader's gonna read. Maybe, unless they skip and, it. <laughs> yeah, and unless it's five pages. If you bore them in the prologue, then you're, they're not going to get to the story. They might it just was, put you down. Yeah, it was really interesting to me to realize that there was kind of um, controversy or whatever about doing prologues or not. Because, again, I kind of didn't really understand prologues. Oh, Maria says, I don't mind prologues. The last prologue I read was in a fantasy novel, and it was a twist slash didn't make sense with the rest of the novel. So to the point where you almost forgotten, it was so good. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, 
I, again, I didn't realize this was controversial because once I realized the mistake I had been making, I read every prologue because I kind of felt like, well, the author took the time to write it. There's obviously going to be information here that I need, but there are people who are like, I don't read prologues and they're actually kind of adamant about it and they think they're dumb and they're annoyed by them. It's a really interesting perspective that I just, I can't get behind it or understand it. Do you guys know why people might feel that way? Mm, I think maybe sometimes people think the author just found this extra little bit they wrote and they wanted to plop it somewhere. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't, I mean, I feel like they're missing out. Um, but it's something that I do keep in mind when I'm writing. So my story, he needs to stand alone without the prologue. Um, well, I was, I but was those who read it will be enhanced. Yes, I was just going to say, perhaps it's the author doing a bad job of understanding the purpose of a prologue that is giving people this bad taste for them. So mm -hmm. I guess if you're going to include one, you need to make sure that it's relevant to the story that you're telling to the reader, that there's a reason that the reader might want to read it and that it, your reader is rewarded for reading it. Otherwise, what is the point of having it at the beginning of your book? Would you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say, though, in mystery, a lot of times they're used, used to... Um, sort of be the first clue or like give you an idea of what the whole mystery is going to be about or, or something. Yeah. They're um, very important. Yeah. Yep. Mom and I, we actually took our first chapter in the one, the cozy we're writing right now and actually turned that into a prologue. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think I, we read that, didn't we? I mean, maybe not, maybe in the postcast. I think you read it as a, I think you read it as a first chapter. Yeah. Was it the woman with the little dog? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I like the little dog. Okay, sorry, mm -hmm. I digress. Um, is it a Pomeranian, by the way? <laughs> yes, and mine's over there wagging her tail. She could hear you, I think. All right, it's kind of looking like we can spend this whole episode just talking about the beginning because we're already almost halfway through our discussion time and we're still still talking about the beginning because prologue is one thing, but what about the actual beginning of your actual story? Now, in our outline we talk about an opening hook. How will you hook your reader so that they must read your story? And again, this is what was weirding me out about my current work in progress because mm -hmm. you know, the feedback I had gotten was, I want to care about your character before something exciting happens to her. And yet when I would read all around the, the interwebs, so to speak, you need to start in the middle of the action so that your reader will care. Ah, help me. How do you do an opening hook? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a huge fan of all the advice that's on the interwebs <laughs> right now. Um, I don't need to be right in the middle of a bullet whizzing past my face in the first sentence or the first word of a book for me to be interested. I sort of like to ease into it. You know, sometimes my life gets a little tense and a little anxious and a book is an escape and I just want to ease into somebody else's life instead of like, oh, they're just as tense and anxious as me. This isn't a vacation at all. Mm. So, um, I think that um, sometimes it's a little exaggerated what they say online these days that you have to have a hook in the first sentence of your book. Right. Yeah. Some, some authors have done that and mm -hmm. done it really well. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a one book where the t the first line and and I'm going to butcher this was the day I died, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. So that hooks you right away. Like, what do you mean the day you died? Um, but and I think it's just genre dependent. I was just going to ask that. Do you think it's specific to genre? Yes, because if you're reading a cozy mystery, you the, you want the feeling to be cozy, and you know you're mm -hmm. curling up and maybe it's stormy outside, and you've got your book and your blanket, and you mm -hmm. don't want to um, go right into like a kung fu scene, <laughs> right? Right. But if you're reading a thriller, mm -hmm. then that might be what you're looking for. You might want that first scene to be a bullet whizzing past your head and mm -hmm. down dark alleys with people chasing you and. Right. So right. I think what we're saying is the action doesn't necessarily have to be like adrenaline-y kind mm -hmm. of action. It could be um, something curling up into a chair and reading a book or opening a window and then curiosity of what do they see out the window or mm -hmm. some some sort of an interesting 
thing. So, I mean, they call it a hook and there's the kind of hook that's like a left hook to the chin. And then mm -hmm. there's the kind of hook that just is hanging in the water waiting for the fish to come by. And I suppose you could do either. Mm -hmm. right. right. So yeah. it can be a more subtle situation as opposed to intense physical action and an adrenaline rush. Right. Right. If your story is character centered, and the thing that's going to drive us through the story is the character and whatever that character is experiencing, then perhaps being in the head of that character in the opening of the story and seeing their um, whatever is like, maybe they're depressed and they want to kill themselves or uh, maybe they're struggling with something. And if we see that internal struggle in the beginning, that can hook us into, I mean, so why do we want to care about their internal struggle? Because you took us there in the very beginning and, we related somehow to that struggle. Mm -hmm. I don't yes. think we necessarily need to know every detail about your character. What we need to do is be able to relate to your character and whatever they're struggling with us touches something inside of us. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I want to believe that it's true. But then I feel like when I sit and I write something that I think is artfully done and crafty and whatever, it just feels like so much is not happening. And so how do you know that you've done it well? And I suppose that's when it comes to uh, trusting yourself and trusting the people that you ask to give it a once over when you're finished. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Because so we, we have yeah. a few um, comments from the chat. All right. Can you get through it, Tina? Or do you need me to read it? You got it? I'm, I'm all right at the moment. Um, Maria says, I think whatever is right for the story and some it will be in the middle of the advice or easing into it. Perhaps it's to do with genre as well, e.g. slower pace and world building with fantasy. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. Gigi says, I like a little tease just to get me interested. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And Maria also said, I tend to start more subtle, but then in my historical fiction, it's not very far before there's a battle action scene. Right. So that kind of, you know, that's kind of along the lines of what we've been saying. It depends mm -hmm. on the story. Well, and there's a question too. So she's like, well, it's not very far until there's a battle scene. Well, how do you ensure that readers read that far? Because, um, okay, and I think that a mistake that a lot of new readers make is to do something shocking or surprising or whatever in the very beginning to hook people or interest people. And unfortunately, especially in non-Christian books, it's vulgar or shocking or gory just for the sake of like, oh, this is sh shocking. And um, that doesn't work for me. I typically am not drawn to that kind. Like for me, well-written first couple of paragraphs will suck me in every time. Oh, this person can write. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm now going to invest my time in this person's reading. So even if it's not action-packed or a mystery or a secret, if the sentences are put together coherently <laughs> and grammatically good and it's, 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 reading easy for me, I'm more likely to invest the time to get to the meat of the story. Uh -huh. I agree with that. One of the best books I've written, written, I've read <laughs> lately, um, was called Dawn of Wonder. I forget the author's name, but he starts out in the woods and there's trees and some squirrels and different things. And then suddenly like this eerie feeling comes upon everyone and everyone just kind of stops and looks around and then it passes and then they go on with, you know, collecting nuts or whatever they were doing. But it was so artfully written that it pulled me right into that book and I wanted to read it. Yeah, that does sound pretty masterful because to describe a peaceful forest scene, you would think snooze mm -hmm. fest, but apparently if it's done well, that is going to engage and grip your reader. So I suppose working on your craft is always, always, always the number one thing you need to be doing. Um, instead of looking for tips or tricks of how to sell poorly <laughs> written work, mm -hmm. and improve your craft so that you become a better writer and people who pick up your work will appreciate what you've done and will want to continue to read. So I would right. think that, that would be the takeaway. So should we move on? Oh, go ahead, Rhonda. What? I was just going to say, that's a good thing about writing a series is because if you get people to fall in love with your characters in the first book, then in the second book, they'll say, Oh, what is this silly sleuth? Can I get themselves into this yes. time? And so they're already hooked pretty much. Well, and that's you something right well, touch on. if you write a series, how much do you need to say about 
you're, it's really tricky, isn't it? So if someone picks up book three of your series and that's their first book, so you have to introduce your character without being able to take all the languid time of building this character. And you have to say with her trusty sidekick noodle, mm -hmm. which is like a popular thing or whatever, like, isn't it tricky to catch people up and not bore your reader who's been with you through two previous books? Well, yeah, it's the same as backstory in your first novel. You don't want too much backstory, but just enough to tell the story. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's maybe a topic for another time. Like, how do you handle that? Because I've read it done well and I've read it done super poorly. And sometimes within the, the same series, <laughs> you know, I'm getting yeah. through the beginning of book six and it's like such and such character who did mm -hmm. this and then did this. And it's like, yes, I already know. Cause I read all those books anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to add that I put a link in the chat um, to that book I was talking about. And if it's the Amazon page, so you can look at the look inside and read that first opening and you can see exactly what I was talking about. Awesome. Well, I mean, I think this is a good breaking point for us to move on and we can continue our elements of story discussion next week because we were pretty much finished talking about um, the opening of your story and we're about to talk about the, the murky middle part, like what happens in there. Yeah. Um, so if you guys are in agreement, we can move on to the feeding of the backs. Yeah. Yay. What? Feeding of the backs? That's really weird. Yes, it is. But what that means is we used to share work and then when someone, we'd go around the table and give everybody a bunch of praise and everything. We'd say, well, is your back well fed? In other words, did you get enough feedback? So anyway, we are going to do feeding of the backs today. Um, if you want to join us, pause the video and write yourself a um, 15 minute story using what words, Rhonda? What were the words today? The words for today, fireplace, <laughs> tree, speed, legend deputy awesome all right do you want to go ahead and share yours with us uh Rhonda? Oh, sure all right let me get it a little bit oh, and i'm just going to tell everybody um these are freshly written just before we went live so nobody had any time to edit anything or polish anything so for that reason we give only positive feedback we do not critique these pieces which sometimes is a really good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want people to continue to participate. We can't rip people to shreds. <laughs> right. Okay. So this is a continuation of the sprint I started yesterday. So this oh, is good. a part two sprint. And uh, if mom is watching this, she'll appreciate part of it. Okay. I'm pleasantly surprised by what lies before me. No, not surprised. Amazed. This is not what I envisioned the inside of the, basically, large metal box to have in store for me. Ms. Labonte Blanche's professional smile grew wider and more sincere at my reaction. I hesitantly stepped toward the crackling fireplace. Crackling? My mind wrapped around the idea that this fireplace, which must be electric, was making such lifelike sounds. I leaned in, automatically holding my hair back so it wouldn't be singed by the fake flames, I guess, and heard the crackling and hissing flames was not my mind playing tricks. With the speed and agility of Vanna White, Miss LeBlanche directed me to the large bedroom toward the back. Now, honey, I know you're interested in that over here, but we'll save Barbie's dream kitchen for last, okay? Okay. I relaxed and allowed her to direct me to what must be a bedroom. She waved at the small bathroom in the short hallway, and I could see by the cursory glance it was larger than the one I use now. I was still trying to calculate the small bathroom square footage when she stopped at the door at the end of the hallway. Somehow she did a drum roll on the hardwood floor with her troll, her toes. Wait, did I say hardwood? I started to bend over to see if they were really wood, but she put her hand on my shoulder and told me so. Sweetie, these floors are made from the legendary Dog Tree Tavern down the road. When the place was struck by lightning several years ago, they were able to save some of these old white pine planks. She smiled at the apparent look of surprise on my face. You know, it was the original stagecoach stop for our pioneers. They say Deputy Doug... Deputy Douglas's first jail was right across the street, too. The end. Okay, so to catch everybody up, she's in a trailer home, which is a mobile home, right? Yep. Okay, because yesterday the prompt was trailer. So um, that's why she said the large metal box. I have to say, you always do such a good job with these characters. And I know you don't appreciate your uh, proclivity for writing first person, but pretty hilarious about the holding the hair back thing. Oh, it's so relatable. And uh, to keep my hair from getting singed from the fake fire, I guess. Like, why am I doing this? It's so funny because you think to yourself these thoughts. Yeah. Love that. Thank you. 
Yeah, I just have to say for Maria's benefit, a trailer is a caravan. So. Oh yeah. In Britain. Oh, so do That's they, they call, call the it. the kind that you park permanently? They still call it a caravan. Yeah. Hmm, that's a good question. Hmm. I think it's just the kind you drive. Let's find out for Maria. Let's find out. I know when I watched um, Broadchurch, they had like a caravan park and it was a bunch of trailers. Oh, okay. Like trailer trailer homes or whatever. like a trailer Caravan park. park. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Love that. And I did notice Vanna White, which I forgot was like the bonus phrase if we used it. In, um, it's in a our static caravan. <laughs> A static caravan. Very clever. I hmm. love that. I do too. I'm never calling a trailer park a trailer park again. I no, me either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just I love um, the subtle details in the in your writing, Rhonda, that bring you right into the story. Um, where like you know, there's no bullets whizzing past, and there's no oh. you know dark alleys and all that, but you mm -hmm. st it still draws you in with. Those little details that make it feel so real. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. yeah, really. You do you do very well with character and setting. It's great. And just enough. Just enough. You're not really overly descriptive to make me crazy. I don't care for lots of description. Right. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, I will go second again just to kind of break up the how much my voice is yakadakin in your ear. Um, and here we go. Mom, where are you? I'm by that big mountain where we spawned in. What are you doing? I want to build a fireplace. The sound of my son's laughter coming over the phone via the three-way call I was on with him and his sister did not deter me. I kept hacking at the iron with my trusty wooden sword. A fireplace, my son squeaked the words out from between laughter. Mom, you don't even have a house yet. But I've always wanted a fireplace. More laughter, and then my daughter said, Mom, he's right, you need to make a house. My daughter's voice telegraphed her amusement, and as she was at the age where there, where she was, there was much that stressed her out and very little which amused her, I was happy to oblige. I felt my brows come together and my bottom lip jut out, and I realized though I was four years, four times the age of my youngest, I was the one acting like a baby. Oh, fine, I said with a sigh. Where do I build the house? There's no time. The sun is going down. Just dig a hole in the side of the mountain and, oh, never mind. You should be safe. Yeah, mom, all that digging you did will keep you safe from the creepers, my daughter said. Good job. Creepers? What's that? Curious, I worked at the keyboard and space bar to turn my on-screen character around and jumped up the hole I had created while mining for ore. <laughs> mom, what are you doing? My daughter's voice, slightly panicked, said, I want to see a creeper. You want to see a creeper? My son was laughing again, this time hard enough that he choked himself and started coughing. Are you okay, Zachary? I asked, mostly out of habit. I was having a hard time getting my orientation correct on the screen and was stuck looking mostly at the sky. All that coughing was quite distracting. Mom, you're a noob. Get back in your hole. You're not in a hole. You're not in a hole, I pointed out. Mom, I know what I'm doing. Mom, I can see you. A creeper is right behind you. The words, you died, flashed on the screen. Without a second's hesitation, I clicked the yes button under the option to respawn here. Okay, you died, but it's okay, mom, my son said patiently. All you have to do is, Zach, she already respawned. There she is over by that crafting table. See her? Mom, no, that's where that wolf was. I'm going to kill it, I said. Now both children were laughing. I couldn't help but chuckle myself. That's right, someone needs to clean up this town, and I have appointed myself deputy. I swung my sword and made my on-screen character walk in a circle as though I couldn't control my movements. The response was just what I expected, guffaws and chiding as my children witnessed my noob behavior. This is fun, Mom, my son said, and it's okay that you're not very good yet. We'll teach you. Yeah, Mommy, it's okay. Three, two, one. I love that story. <laughs> Who said that video games can't be a family Tina, you're game? muted. You totally got me. I was like, oh, this is going to be a really cool fantasy story. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, but, but your character seems so, like, not fantasy <laughs> at the same time. And I was, about, I was like, thinking about how I was going to relay that to you, how this was awesome. And then it was. Uh, <laughs> okay. I was confused by the fantasy. spawning at the beginning. I didn't, because I don't know what game you're playing. I assume it's yeah. like Minecraft or something. It's Minecraft, Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but I thought that you guys were building sandcastles. Oh. And so I'll tell you what drew me in was like, oh, sandcastles. We used to do those. I wonder if they do them like we did. So I was drawn into your story from the very beginning, speaking of hooks, just because of how it could might have related to my uh, story in the past or whatever. But that was so good. I love that idea. Yeah, well, I was going to tell y'all what it was before I started reading. I'm glad but you didn't. I'm like, no, I'm not going to. so much better that you didn't. Mm -hmm. But I kind of, I'm curious. I would be curious to for you to let your children read that and see if they get it right off the bat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The spawning probably would give it away. Because we don't uh -huh. play Minecraft. I know what it is because my son's played it in the past. But well, it does might get it right away. Guess what has two thumbs and got Minecraft for her birthday from her children? <laughs> <laughs> this gal, it was funny because um, my kid just happened to ask me to play, but really we play a lot more Roblox this way than we play Minecraft, but um, uh, it's been kind of fun. Now, not that I haven't played before, but this this is a close to, it's a creative nonfiction, isn't it? I don't know, because this is very much an amalgamation mm -hmm. of actions that have happened over mm -hmm. the course of us playing together, right? Because yeah, yes, I'm a like total it. noob. Yes, they laugh at me. Yes, they mm -hmm. think I'm ridiculous. Finally made it here. Oh my gosh, Jamie, that was so much fun listening to Deputy Jamie. <laughs> More like Deputy Dog. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks, Jen. And I'm so glad to see you joining us and in the chat. Hi, Jen. Hi. Oh, I just love her profile picture. Look at it. Oh, I miss her face, I think. She's like a supermodel. Yeah, so pretty. Um, Jamie, even if you never do anything else with the story, would you please print it and put it with your in like your family trunk? Okay. And date it and just kind of say what it's about because that has got to be preserved. That was so good. Ah, thanks. I will. And for any of you moms or dads out there, you know, you can really impress these kids with your OG gaming skills sometimes because there will be like a thing where you have to like jump over the fireballs as they come at you and your kids are sure you're going to totally die, but you're like, no, man, I uh, played Mario. I, can I played draw. Sonic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, for Christmas this year, my kids bought me a Switch so I could play the new Zelda. Ooh, yes, I love Zelda. I used to play Spyro. Like, that was my game. I don't know Spyro. I'll have to look I that up. Either. It's a little dragon, and he goes around. The oh! Yeah, and he jumps over things, and he spits flames at things. So what I did not know is that if you have an error online and the little dinosaur shows up, if you hit the space bar, you can play a jumping game with him. And this happened to me when I was doing um, a live. I was trying to show a video to a class full of co-op kids, homeschool kids. And I got the little dinosaur and they told me, oh, you can play a game if you. So anyway, you make the dinosaur run and jump over stuff. And I was killing it. And all these kids are like, ah, because they were sure that because I had never seen it before, I was going to totally choke. But it's like, no, man, <laughs> I've been jumping on mushrooms and going down pipes since, you know, back in the day. Before All you right. were twinkle in your daddy's eye. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Tina, what did you come up with with these amazing prompt words? Uh, well, I hate to follow you two. And I just have to say that um, I have congestion. <laughs> 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 that's, my, that's my excuse. Okay, here we go. The fireplace glowed with orange light as the flames licked at the logs. The crackling sound it made made Angelica feel sleepy and her eyes drifted closed. She was warm and cozy under the thick bear skins she, they'd given her, and it was nice not to be cold in the evening for the first time since leaving the village. Images of black smoke with the faces of demons filled her mind. They were chasing her, and no matter how fast she ran, they matched her speed. Then she was standing at the edge of the bluff, grasping a tree as she leaned over, looking down on Petra's broken body below. She reached for him, and then she was falling. Just before she hit the bottom, she woke with a start. A little cry escaped her lips, and Mary touched her shoulder. You okay? she asked. Angelica nodded, taking deep breaths to calm her racing heart. The old man Christopher, who'd found her on the beach and brought her here, cleared his throat and raised a hand in the air. The others quieted when it was silent, and he said in a resounding voice, The legend of the great fish Iliamna. Angelica had never heard this story before, and she forgot all about her dream and leaned forward to soak in every word. 
There is a very large fish that roams the waters of this lake. He moves about in the darkness of deep waters, but sometimes he comes to the surface and is seen. But woe to the man who does see the great fish, for he only surfaces to topple the canoes of wicked men and gobble them up. Angelica had been on the lake in the canoe, and she... Three, two, one... <gasps> ah. Ah. Um, apparently my internet went out, and I came in when she was standing over Petra. So I missed the beginning of that, but the end was so enthralling. It just... Thank you. It's amazing was... to me because when you wrote before about a wise person at the fire telling a story, we were like awkwardly trying to figure out how to give you all of this negative feedback that we had about it. <laughs> because we were just like, it was so different than what you just wrote, which was... Mm -hmm this girl is curious and invested. And now we have kind of some perspective going into hearing the story, which was what was missing before, before it was just this happened and this happened and this happened. And mm -hmm. now we are invested. We, we like Angelica. We've been on this adventure with her. If we are blessed enough to be with you as you do all these word sprints, because the rest of you are just get to wait for the book anyway. And now we care to hear what she hears. We understand how she's reacting and, and the story means something different to us because we are mm -hmm. um, invested in your character. So much better and so, so, so good. Good, good, good job. Oh, thank you. Yep. And we're seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting, you know, what we didn't before. It's just so much deeper. It's yeah. wonderful. And so, and and not as many words and not as... Uh, belaboring certain points or or whatever. You're telling us just what we need. It's so good, Tina. Good job. Right. And you're able to just do that in 15 minutes. You just, there's no time to edit or do anything and it still comes out that good. So you've flipped a switch. That's you know, it was the right part switch. Part of it is because I have this like rough draft where mm -hmm. I've already told the story. And so now I'm just mm -hmm. re refining it, I guess. And, yeah. Uh, going by memory of what was said the first time which I don't remember like the whole story I put in because there is an actual legend of Iliamna, which there's, there's a lake in Alaska called Lake Iliamna and it's shaped like a whale. If you look at it from a satellite mm -hmm. and um, there's a legend of a great fish that lives in this lake and there is some kind of big, I don't know what I th think they think it's a sturgeon or something that might be the wrong kind of fish. But it's huge, and so, and it's been seen by people, and there's pictures of it, like from the sky. So there's just, but the natives have a legend about the fish, um, and that it topples the canoes of bad natives. Like that's the legend. Wow, hmm. fascinating. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you did a really, really wonderful job with that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um. And I just want to say that we love to read what our listeners come up with in their 15 minute sprint. So set a timer and write your own 15 minute story using the words fireplace, tree, speed, legend, and deputy, or just wave at those words on the way by and write for 15 minutes based on whatever inspires you. Uh, might be the fireplace, might be the deputy, but the challenge is to use all of the words and would also help you if you get stuck and don't know what to write. Something else I want to point out is if your piece does not come out as polished as um, say Tina's piece did, um, don't worry. And as you go into National Novel Writing Month, don't worry then either. Because like Tina said, she is now going back and exercising craft. When she did her first draft, she was just getting the story down on paper. And that's what NaNoWriMo is all about. Please don't get hung up during the month of November trying to produce excellently polished and perfect work. That's really not what it's about. It's about getting the story down so that you can take that raw material and make it something better. You can't edit a blank page. Isn't that right? That's true. That yes. So true. So there you go. There's a little bit of advice for nothing. So um, anybody else want to say anything about the ideal of not worrying about it being perfect the first time through? You know, I just want to say that um, it took me several years to get here to this point where I have this this... I rewrote that book twice and now I'm kind of rewriting it a third time almost. Um, but it just keeps getting better. And it, I think that 
the quality in the end is going to be worth the, all the work. And so don't get discouraged when you feel like it's never going to end. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> and me also. Yes, we have to remember whatever episode number this is. Let's go back and watch the end of episode blah de blah, blah to encourage ourselves. All right. Well, ladies, this is my least favorite time of the podcast, but not today because um, my accountability is not so bad. It's the accountability corner. So we check in with each other <laughs> and we say, what was your writing goal for this week? Did you meet your writing goal for this week? And we set some goals for next week as well. Um, Tina, I will go to you first. And can you lift your little microphone up just a little bit? Because you've gotten significantly quieter in your attempt to to uh, shield us from hearing coughing. So Sorry. what? that's okay. What was your goal and how did you do? Um, my goal was to keep work, to go to office hours every day. And um, I did not do it because I was sick. Aww. So um, the first on Monday, it was my son got, he was started getting sick on Saturday and by Sunday he was miserable and he pretty much did not sleep Sunday night. And so the good mother that I pretend to be, oh. I stayed up with him and tried to do all kinds of things to try to ease his discomfort. Um, well, and when, you know, when your head is all full of congestion, it's one of those things, you know, how the, the least is serious burn hurts the worst. It's like mm -hmm. the least serious sickness just makes you the most miserable. And so I didn't get much sleep Monday night and then by, or Sunday night, then by Monday night, I was sick. So, and I'm just starting to, I just got my taste back this morning when my first sip of turmeric tea, so. Well, and um, sleep is very important to you. I mean, you've been struggling a lot with getting sleep. And so it's probably made you feel extra worn down that you're not getting the sleep you have been. Yeah, it's hard to wear your CPAP mask when your nose is congested. Uh, mm. so. But overall, you're making excellent progress on your work. We were just kind of talking about how you're in the third act of your book. Yes. Yeah. yeah and all the action speeds up now. And so I feel like it's going to go faster. So today is Rock Friday. <laughs> okay. Today is Friday and we'll be together again on Friday next week. And what do you want to be able to report to us that you have accomplished by next Friday? Well, I can't come to office hours on Monday because I have homeschool co-op. Um, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I would like to get through three more scenes or chapters or whatever um, breakdown of my book. Okay, that sounds good. One a day is what you're mm -hmm. aiming for. So three chapters. Three chapters or scenes. I'm I'm not sure if it. It some scenes are harder to get through than others. Well, in the revising process, so. Yeah, totally for sure. Depends on how bad the first one was. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. um, we will be there and cheering you on. So, uh, uh, Jen Jennifer gave hers. For next, yay! For next week, Jennifer will be on the podcast. She says she misses us so much. Well, can you blame her? I mean, <laughs> our beautiful and scintillating uh, topics of conversation. Um, yay, Jennifer! That's so exciting. And if you if you can even make it into the office hours for just a second to say hello to us, we would love to see your beautiful face. Also, that's and she, she also said she had no goals, so she met them. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> We should make her be the host. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> All right. I'll go next. Um, I am pretty happy with what I accomplished. And mostly because last night I was like, I have not accomplished enough. So I sat down and accomplished a bunch of stuff so that I wouldn't have to come here and have disappointing report for office hours. But the thing is, um, I have gotten through one, two, three, four, five, six chapters that I feel like I could hand to somebody to read and they would be able to say, okay, five and a half. They would like, it's good enough to where it's like, give me your feedback on this. How am I doing? So yay. So I guess I would say first edit or, or pretty polished, I feel. So I am on the sixth chapter um, of that process. And I am really happy because I am cooking with gas. And I'm sitting down and actually getting a lot done when I sit down. 
I do think I, I told you guys I had to put in some like red herring kind of material. And I do think that will need significant tweaking when I get to that. But I'm just going to keep plowing ahead. Um, I did pick a beginning and stick with it a couple of weeks back. So my goal is going to be to get through to where I could tell you I am on chapter eight. So I'm at eight and a half. So like basically three chapters, like Tina said, but my goal, my secret goal is to do way more than that. Because like Tina said, some of it may be so good already that I just have to do some grammar tweaking and whatever. And I don't have to go back and put in so much story. But I feel like a lot of what was lacking in this first draft was like the relationship. So more dialogue between my main characters to make people kind of want to ship them because I want people to want Frank and Moxie to get together. So I need more things that will make people want that. Um, I do think the story is told, but or the tale is told. How do you put that, Tina? Now I got to put in the story. Um, the plot is there. You got to plot put is there. In the now I got to put in the story. Yeah. So mm -hmm. by next week, I want to be able to say I am in chapter eight and currently working in chapter eight. Okay. So what do you say, Rhonda? Mar Mar before we move on, Maria put hers up. Um, she got no editing done with being ill. I feel you, Maria but was pleased to still be able to get some outlining for Nano done. I'm hoping to get some editing office hours done next week. All right. Yeah. And Nano is coming, man. It's the 18th already. So it's good for, to be prepared. I don't even want to think about it, even though I probably should be thinking about it. I don't know what to do. Blah. Okay. What about you, Rhonda? What do you have to report for us? Uh, well, um, my office hours have just been completely non-existent. I've been terrible about it, putting other things ahead of it that should not have been there. So anyway, uh, yesterday I rededicated myself. I went to the writing altar and I rededicated myself to my office hours and just my writing career. Um, this has been a absolutely horrible month for me and I have not been able to accomplish anything. I like literally for um, three and a half weeks, I didn't even open my computer, even to do genealogy. And I mean, what's wrong with me? It's gotta be something wrong with me. So anyway, um, so starting next week, I am back on regular office hours, whether anybody else joins me or not. These are my office hours, my career. I can't say, oh, nobody else is gonna be there. I'll just do them later. No, I've got to stick to a habit. So that is what you can hold me accountable for next week. All right. And I'll be in Florida. I'll be on vacation in Florida next week. And I still intend to do it. So you were saying starting Tuesday yeah. and um, you're there and we come or we don't come. You don't care. You're going to be there. Yep. And um, what's the status of your publication? Um, I have been working at, um, I'm in at my cabin right now doing like a mini reading retreat. Oh. And I was showing someone last week, um, what I had and that I was getting ready to hit publish. And they said, you really need to work on your resources a little bit. And for this, they're absolutely right. It, I would have regretted pushing publish just so I could say I push publish um, and not do my resources, which are like the number one currency in genealogy to have good resources. So they're absolutely right about that. So I've been straightening those all out. And I would think I've only got another day or two just to make sure I've gone through and got everything fact checked. And how has the writing retreat been for you? Wonderfully relaxing. Yeah. It's been a very nice time. And um, I know that you wrote yesterday because yes. I got to read your sprint. Did you continue the pattern? Did you do any more sprinting? A little bit, yeah. Awesome. And when you come to office hours, which project are, is it that you're going to be working on? Well, I'm going to be dividing it up because I'm going to dedicate three hours every day. And so... Um, an hour and a half is going to be for the fiction and, um, at least half hour, 45 minutes is going to be for like social media. And I've got to start promoting at some point. So I, I need to research that. Um, so anyway, an hour and a half is going to be solid writing and the rest is going to be peripheral stuff. Awesome. Well, those are some very realistic and concrete goals. And so good for you because, that's how progress happens. If you make a goal and you achieve the goal and you just eat that elephant one bite at a time. So mm -hmm. I'm very encouraged for you. Is there anything else in the chat that we need to acknowledge? Um, somebody wanted to know what my mug said. It's, oh. It says, um, dear mom, I get it now. 
Aww. <laughs> my, um, my son James, who's 26, gave it to me after his daughter was born. Aww. Um, I just wanted to, in case anyone else was wondering. Mm -hmm. That's um, so Maria sweet. Maria says a writing retreat in a cabin sounds awesome. It was. <laughs> yeah. I know. When you said you were going up there, I was like, oh, I want to go. But then I got sick. Oh, well, yes. You would not have been allowed. Well, last we need, time we went, I was sick. What is up with that? Oh, that's we, true. We need to, need to, need to figure out how to get you guys down here, even if it's only for like two days, because flights here are like $56 one way. Mm -hmm. And so like we can get you here pretty cheaply. You have free lodging. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So we've, and we can also get you up here too. Ooh, yes. My daughters are going up there. I'm so jelly. They have a, a another dance. And uh, they'll be up there in November. And then uh, I have no idea what my holiday life looks like. Blah. Anyway, I digress. I tried so, to get my son to go to that dance. And he refuses. Oh. Like, I would go if I didn't have to dress up. I don't see the point of dressing up. So he's not going. Hmm. <laughs> like, he doesn't want to dress up. Um, would you like to tell Maria where you are, Jamie? Where I am? Mm-hmm. I am so in, here in Michigan. Oh no, I'm in Wildwood, Florida right now. And um, we're talking about visiting Flint, Michigan. So Wildwood, Florida is sort of by Orlando, you know, where Disney, Disney world is and stuff like that. It's an hour mm -hmm. for me to get there. And I'm also about an hour and a half to the ocean on either side with a golf on one side and the um, ocean on the other. So pretty much central Florida is how people would describe mm -hmm. where I live. Um, Maria. Okay. So let me get my handy map out. How do I do this here? <laughs> okay. So is that right? No, it goes like this for, yeah, the, camera. for the camera. All right. So this is a general area that the four of us lived in three of us now. And right here is where I am right now. That's our map of Michigan in case you didn't understand what she was doing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And what's really interesting is I moved from one peninsula to another. So yeah. I used to be here and now I'm like <laughs> here and in Florida, make fingers pointier. Kinda, like this knuckle right there is sort of about where I live. I'm kind of between these two knuckles. And so here, oops, here is where the tropical stuff is happening that ruined my camp out. So... All right. Well, um, I think we pretty much wrapped it up unless anybody wants to uh, shout out anything else before we wrap it up. Okay. Well, in that case, this concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Until next time, may your pen be prolific. May your deadlines be met. And may all of your words honor Christ. Bye. See you Bye. next week. Bye.